beautiful, Bobby. Beautiful. Thank you. Aloha, guys. Bobby, it's coming. It's, it's a little bit on the scratchy side. Can you, um, your guitar, could you uh, uh, maybe position a little differently? Or is that coming through an amp? Or, or is that just me, my, my uh, speaker? Oh, a little scratchy. Okay, let me, let me bring the volume down a little bit. Okay, because it's really sweet. Just love the slack key. And, uh, is that better, my brother? Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Let me know, bro. Let me know. That's good. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. This is our 13th Music and Speaker Series. My name is Vincent Kimura. I'm the Chapter President for Waimanalo, also on the Statewide Executive Board. We're really thankful for you to join us in this. We're, we're honored to have uh, Bob Schaefer and Bobby Madero um, as our 13th Music and Speaker Series. Um, we're going to kick it off with a little bit more music from Bobby Madero Jr. It's the Bobby and Bobby Show. It's great being here, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. Take you guys to the island of Hawaii, where my mom is from. Um, it's very, it's an honor to be here with you all. Uh, my father is a landscape contractor. And so growing up, um, it's definitely an honor to be a part of uh, the arts of the greens of Hawaii, because without that, guys, we need a lot more of that. We need a lot more of that. So I take you to the island of Hawaii where my mom is from, to the Leeward Coast. So to the Ikona, goes like this, guys. He goes like this.
song entitled Ikona for you guys. Thank you so very much. Yeah. Okay, do this song taking us to the island of Maui. To the island of Maui, one of the first uh, sugar trains there on the island. It's called Kaikahului. Speaking of the first sugar train there, baby, taking care of the sugarcane plantation there in Kahului. So I felt it befit this beautiful uh, project that we're all doing here. Keeping Hawaii green, baby. Keeping Hawaii green. Something like this. Here come all along walk on the look at I Sounds good. We'll see you. We'll see you after Bobby and uh, and I uh, have this chat. But and thank you so much, Bobby. That was beautiful, man. Um, you know, I got some feedback from folks that it's not coming across as clear. Um, I don't know what could be done on your end. Uh, I it, it sounded it sounded great because I know the songs and I was following along and singing along and loving it. But um, maybe uh, I don't know if it's being getting closer or what, but um, maybe Vince Kimura can communicate with you on the side about it. Vincent, this is Dave, can you hear me? Yeah, hi Dave. Hi, uh, my tech consultant says we should be using original sound. And I think wow. uh, that, that uh, she does Kanakapilas all over the world all this last year. With so original sound, original sound on Zoom? Yep. Yes, that's right. 
That's what you Vincent, said. you got that on original sound? We got to do it on Bobby's side, guys. Let's keep moving. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, David. That was David Case, recently retired secretary of HFUU, and our organization would not be where it is today if it wasn't for this man. Nice to see you, David. Nice to hear your voice. Okay, there he is right there at the podium, too. Look at that, at our convention. So aloha, everybody. This is Vincent Mean. I'm president of Hawaii Farmers Union United, and I just really appreciate uh, us having another one of these series tonight. This is, uh, this is something we look forward to every other week, and the quality of, of expertise that we were able to bring into HFUU and share from a place of their knowledge and, and understanding and, and have that communicated to our membership is just so appreciated. Here, this was this past convention we had, well, actually not this past convention, this was, this was in 2019 when we had our last physical convention. Uh, we have 13 chapters across the state, one on Kauai, three on Oahu, four on Maui, and five on the Big Island. And so um, we're growing too. Look at these folks. And this is at our 2019 convention. And uh, this was after, this is at the end of the convention. Everybody was stoked at the level of uh, quality of level of expertise we had at the convention and the presentations. We had over 50 presentations under six tents. And then we, we replicated the same thing this past year, uh, but we did it virtually. And uh, this, is, this shows you all of our speaker series uh, participants that we've had in the past, the musicians and the people presenting. And so we're really uh, excited and continuing this, this whole tradition here. And this past year, this was our convention that we had virtually. We had over 55 presentations and the likes of Joel Salatin, and Dr. Elaine Hale and Paul Stamets and Ray Archuleta. It was just an amazing conference. And you can find it online if you go to hfuu.org. For a nominal price, you can get all these presentations plus a three-hour concert that was curated by Micah Nelson, Willie Nelson's son. So, and these were all the musicians on that three-hour. It was just off the hook. I look at these people and I realize, remember, you know, listening to that three hours, and it was just so cool. So, uh, yeah, please, those of you didn't attend, please go on and and you'll support the organization by. Um, purchasing it, and then you'll support yourself by all the content that you'll find on it. So uh, with that, tonight, it's the Bobby and Bobby show. Uh, Bob Schaefer and I go way back. I met Bobby at the uh, Acres USA conference and uh, back in the 90s, and it really inspired me to bring soil health to the forefront in my work, uh, not only as beginning president of, eight, uh, of Hawaii Organic Farmers, Association back in 1998, but also as uh, with my wife and I producing body and soil conferences, which Bobby was a presenter at a number of them from 2001 to 2013. And then in 2010, um, being a founding member of the Hawaii Farmers Union United, which is a chapter of the National Farmers Union. We're actually a chartered chapter. If you look over my shoulder, there's our charter with National Farmers Union. And uh, it was the first in 2017, it was the first time in uh, 11 years that a state chapter was chartered under National Farmers Union. So that brings us as a voice to the table at a national level. I also recently was voted onto the executive board of the National Farmers Union. I sit on the Department of Agriculture board uh, here in Hawaii and uh, just have a, an amazing supportive team around me in the likes of who you see tonight, Vincent Kimura, and Annabelle Brook as our vice president, and Rebo Oday as our treasurer, and Maureen Data as our secretary, and then all our other chapter presidents. So I really feel that we have such a wonderful organization. And um, I wanted to introduce you to Katie Zuber, who's our communications director. There's Katie. Hi, Katie. Hello. Katie hails out of Hana, and uh, she just had a baby, Oliver, and always has <laughs> Oliver with her. I think the husband's watching. Oliver now, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really, really great to have Katie on board. And Katie, want to say hi to everybody and and uh, just uh, share what you do, please? Yeah, yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm new to HFUU. I've um, really only been with the organization since last summer, but super, super excited. Uh, there's a lot of great things coming up, so please stay tuned, check your emails, and also uh, we're always open to um, ideas and feedback. So and you're yeah. social you're so you're heading the social media post right 
So yes, the, um, yeah, tag us in things, uh, hashtag HFUU, or just tag us um, HFUU official in Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and I'm trying to really get that going. So wonderful. super excited. Yeah, Katie, thank you so much. Really, you know, it's it's wonderful that you're stationed there in Hana. You know, Hana is the pickle here on Maui, and and as <laughs> Hana goes, the rest of the island goes. So we really love and appreciate the Hana chapter. And what they're doing, they hold a farmer's market every Friday. And through the COVID monies that have been coming through the county, they've taken those monies and they give them out in scripts to the elders and the individuals and family members so that they can go to the farmer's market and shop using those scripts. So it's been a really a wonderful um, uh, uh, program that HANA has uh, embraced and brought forward. So we really appreciate the HANA chapter leadership that's going on there. Yeah, if you're ever in, in Hana on Fridays, uh, three to five, it's an incredible farmer's market. Yeah, and it's great because they have it right outside the bank. So when people mm -hmm. are going to cash their checks for their work week, they're going right by the farmer's market and they stop in and it's a great community gathering. And yeah, I'm it looking forward perfect. to getting there myself. Our bank is only open 90 minutes a day, so. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Gotta make it work. <laughs> That's right. So uh, thank you, Katie. And uh, so Bobby, aloha brother. Aloha Kako. Aloha Kako. And, uh, you know, it's just so nice to have this chat with you, Bob. Uh, you know, you and I have had uh, numerous conversations and been working together a lot over the years. And so this will be, uh, this will be just like we normally do. <laughs> I honestly haven't found anything more fun in farming uh, than cover crops. The best thing to do is to plant cover crops go out and walk them, observe them, and plant more cover crops based on what you learned from the first one and repeat. So Bobby, what is what are some of the cover crops that do really well here in Hawaii? Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, lots of materials to work with here. I can certainly list uh, the plants that I primarily work with right now. And I'll say first that in my selection list, what I'm looking for this, of course, for plants that'll produce enough biomass. I'm looking for to grow a legume, a grass, and a forb together, because a legume and a grass and a forb together has been shown for 30 or 40 years now to produce the most biomass compared to growing just grasses or just legumes or just forbs. But for example, uh, in grasses here in Hawaii, well, excuse me, I wanted to say that one of the things that I'm picking these species for is for their non-host status to plant parasitic nematodes. Plant parasitic nematodes are one of the biggest problems in soil borne pests in the world. And certainly here in Hawaii, uh, I need to watch what I plant because I don't wanna be raising plant parasitic nematodes. So in grasses, I use a lot of black oats, Sudan sorghum or sorghum Sudan, millet, buckwheat, uh, sunflowers and corn. Uh, sunflowers and corn are big plants. Now, some of them can be host. If I use a non-host plant, that's where the soil's real clean. I don't have root knot nematode and I can get by a year or so. And then of course, if we're talking about grazing grasses, then we go into uh, a number of others like uh, Kikuyu and Pangola. Uh, carpet grass and bona grass, some of the big C4 producers if we're going to graze them with animals. For legumes, we've got great choices. We've got perennial peanut. Perennial peanut is such a fantastic plant for us. What we need in Hawaii in terms of perennial peanut is more choices of cultivars. We're not very good in Hawaii with having named cultivars and having more access to the 30 or 40 cultivars of perennial peanut that are found around the world. But perennial peanut is one of my big choice, uh, one of my favorite choices. Sun hemp, cow peas, are all non-host to plant parasitic nematode. Pigeon pea. I've got 23 ascensions from Iskrat in India right now that I'm working with here on the Big Island to sort out. It's the first time we've ever seen them. They're all elite cultivars of pigeon pea. Some of them are very short. They're only a foot and a half tall. They produce real heavy and real quick. Some of them are tall and produce over a long period of time. So I'm working with pigeon pea extensively. If we're gonna graze them, once again, I can go to Lucena, I can go to trefoils, and I can go to desmodium, which are fantastic. Bobby, one other, one other group of plants that I'm working with here just quickly are brassica, all of the forbs, both right. plantain, mustards, 
and some of the specialty hybrid, hybrids, a typical hybriding of brassica like uh, Winfred and Graza. These are workhorse plants for me in forbs, legumes, and grasses. Well, that's that's exactly where I was going to go with this. I was wondering about you know the radishes and the brassicas in that respect. I know behind me in this picture, there's a this is a stand of a sun hemp that we rolled and crimped, and uh, you know we're we're going down this road here to see how we can best use this as a weed mat, and at the same time you know grow for cover crop seed. What is your thoughts around this, these kind of uh, uh, cultural practices? I started rolling crops in uh, about 1995 in California. We did it out of necessity. Sometimes we found that we had too large of a uh, bell beans. It was bell beans typically for us. Some springs they would get eight feet tall. And we found by just pushing them over, we got tremendous benefit. It saved us money. We didn't have to mow the stem of the cover crop and therefore that stem will lay on the ground and I could drive tractors over it all summer long, protecting the soil, keeping me from have to, having to disc. On one farm, we saved $80,000 the first year I went to a roll down cover crop. That image in back of you reminds me to say that, remember, if we've got one acre or we've got 100 acres, we don't have to cover crop it all the same. For example, I can see this beautiful sun hemp that has been left standing. One of the things that I could do over on the other side, I could either throw another cover crop seed into that and grow another biomass if I don't need that side, or I could be growing sun hemp and then I'll say Winfred and Graza, two hybrid brassica in strips down through the field. Then I can roll down the sun hemp leave the brassica to form the really deep roots that we're looking for from the brassica to penetrate our hard soils. Right. If anything that you do with cover, anything that I do with cover crops, one of the first jobs is to break hard soils without excessive tillage. Right. Well, you know, Bobby, when we had our body and soil conferences, we had the, um, the trenches, yeah, the backhoe trench, and looking at the different soil horizons, yeah. And that was pretty telling. And I know you were a big part of that and communicating, you know, getting people to see what they were looking at with the fact that, you know, roots weren't making it down into the lower soil horizons. So what you're talking about here then is the, how the, to create the environment for the architecture of nature to be developed as the roots go down deep and starting to open up the soils for, for a better uh, uh, moisture penetration, right? And, and also humic development. Yeah, could you speak some about the importance of that humic development in the soil? Sure, and let's link this to roots right away in this conversation because if, if we are to say the cover crop is important, we have to look at it above ground. There's many functions above ground. Of course, just the covering of soil is critically important, but below ground is really the action on the cover crop for me. Because if I am to come to fields that have been farmed a long time, what they're going to be is hard and low in SOM, low in humus, and low in organic matter in general. The hardness of the soil is the reason that I went to brassica. Uh, canola in general will not do it. Mustards will not do it. Our soils are very hard. They are in California also. And so going to the Winfred and the Graza uh, is really a big step because these have the ability in their roots to penetrate very hard compacted soils. In Kauai, for example, I have images of Winfred and Graza going a foot and a half into the soil, a good five or six inches past the, the, the disc pan. Usually at about seven inches of soil, we have an old hard layer that's been formed by disking, repeated disking down through the years or tillage in general. All right. Breaking through that, to get a cover crop to break through that is critical. Now I will say that sun hemp has pretty good penetration ability as a tap-rooted legume, but nothing compared to these brassica. Right. And what we want is once the root gets in the ground, it's following the pores in the soil down deep. When that root dies, the entire root channel is, most, is the part of the plant most likely to turn to humus. This is because the carbon is trapped, the whole column, the whole rhizosphere is loaded with bacteria and fungi. There were PGPR and other organisms on the root. And when, once again, when the carbon, when the plant dies and the carbon is yielded up, all the microbes are right there. And that conversion of the root due to its lignified state 
is going to turn to humus. And it's the most, on the percentage basis, it's the part of the plant that turns to humus most. So this is, so this is, this is interesting too, Bobby, because of the, you know, so folks out there to understand the importance of humus, that it's, the, from my understanding correctly, then it's the furthest breakdown of organic matter that can happen that ends up being stable to further breakdown. Is that a good way of putting it? Well, it is. Humus is the end product of decomposition, as we call it, for a material in the soil. Now, the key feature of humus is its tremendous surface area, its ability to hold water, its ability to hold nutrients and to release the water easily, release the nutrients easily, easily to the plant. You see, for us as farmers, by increasing our soil organic matter, we're going to have more humus. And humus and clay are the only two materials in soil that hold nutrients for us in large volume and release, hold and release water for us in a large volume. And we can't change the clay. So we can change the humus and the humus has a greater influence on the plant than the clay in that way. So, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, I, and I've said this before to everybody, they've heard me say it. That's why we all need to have more of a sense of humus, right? It's, 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 it's dealing with this, this soil, the important soil building components and how to get there, how to build that architecture in the soil. Now that leads me to this whole, you know, one time you had this amazing um, articulation of soil microbes and the surface of the soil. So when you have leaf matter on the surface, you were telling me about how microbes, they live and die, you know, underneath that leaf litter, you can see some activity, but the ones you can't see, you know, they're living and dying. And then when they die, their extracellular structure gives out 10% free nitrogen. Can you talk to that please, as far as, you know, when we're talking about building the biomass in that rhizosphere, what benefits we get along those lines? Well, in terms of soil and the surface of the soil, the surface is real important. It would be sort of the equivalent to our surfaces. We have our nostrils and our mouth and our eyes that need to stay open. The soil has pores at the surface if it's healthy and needs to stay open. The soil surface is really the spot where two food webs are, are, are merging. We have the above ground food web on the soil surface that's comprised of about nine macroscopic animals, a beetle larvae, fly larvae, the orbited mite, uh, spring tails, millipedes, the earthworm, the entrachean worm, and a couple others. And these small animals are able with their teeth called mandibles to chew up organic matter into small enough pieces to where those little pieces can go into the open pores in soil this is how nature designed the breakdown of leaves and twigs and organic matter to be decomposed on the surface by chewing, or excuse me, to be broken up into small pieces on the surface by chewing. Once those little pieces, organic matter, can get into the soil, they are soil organic matter, then they meet the second food web, the soil's food web, comprised of microscopic bacteria, fungi, nematode, and protozoa. The bacteria are the first to encounter these small pellets from the guts of the animals on the surface and also the small pieces of organic matter. And the bacteria quickly capture the nitrogen in those materials, take them into their body. So now they can't get away. I really enjoy the thought that I have a cover crop. It's a plant out on the soil that I grew for a few pennies. And when that cover crop dies, it becomes into the body of a microbe. Mm. This to me represents the power of feeding the microbe. I'm growing plants on this earth to feed microbes that take care of my plants. Let's look at the work by Dr. Thomas White now and his rhizophage information to where he's demonstrated that the root tip of plants are now known. We were always suspicious of this, but now we know for certain apparently that the root tip is able to absorb entire microbes, hmm. take their energy, and then feed back out some of the digested microbe uh, material back out into the rhizosphere and repeat. This answers a lot about how the plant is actually surviving in some of the soils that they survive in. Let's note too here before we get too far that compost and cover crops are 
really being examined right now at the highest levels of science because we've seen that there is a system at work here. The system is organic matter management, nutrient management, and tillage management. Organic matter management is cover crops, compost, and mulches. Nutrient management is watching out for using soil analysis and watching out for the balance of minerals in soil because they greatly influence the decomposition of organic matter. And then, of course, having a reasonable beneficial disturbance in our tillage practices. So we're going to use these three groups. We're going to create a system. And from that, we're going to get a constant supply of living roots in the soil. We're going to cover the soil. We're going to make the soil more resistant and tolerant. We're going to have the soil in a state to where it's diversified because of the compost, because of the cover crop and the life that it supports. The soil will become diversified and then we're on our way to actually have healthy soil that will provide to the plant and provide to us, which is the goal, of course, is to have healthy food in a healthy environment in our agroecosystems. Bobby, could you talk to uh, the folks here too to better understand about, you're talking about the clays holding nutrients. So they do that magnetically, right? Uh, there's the anion, cation. Could you just speak to that? in a way that the layman's term, they could better understand how the microbes pull those minerals off of the clays and what they do in the relationship to the soil root? Sure, the easy way to understand clay and soil is to realize that when we say clay, in soil science at least, when we say clay, we mean a particle size. We're not talking about a specific material. We're talking about a, a size. Clay is a colloid. Humus is a colloid. A colloid is a material that is so small and so light that it doesn't really ever land once it's disturbed. So in the soil, we have two colloids, clay and humus. The clay and the humus both have charge. Now, the thing about the clay is, and particularly our clays here in the subtropics, there are different species of clay. Ours here in the subtropics are predominantly on your island and Maui are holosite. That's all the red clay that you see. It's holosite. Here on the big island, we have a very strange clay and other oxides also. We have a very strange clay called aliphane. Here in New Zealand have aliphanic clays. The thing to know about clay is that with their charge, nutrients attach very strongly to the clay, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium attach very strongly. Depending on the type of clay, it's hard for the plant to pull off water and to pull off nutrients depending on the conditions in the soil. To improve that performance of the clay, what we need is organic matter. To, to improve the performance of the plant uptaking nutrients, we need humus to complement the clay. And where we'll find the clay in those conditions where we have enough organic matter coming in the system, which is critical here in the subtropics, is when the clay and the humus and the nutrients are all become aggregated. It's mm -hmm. in the aggregates in soil or in right. compost. It's in the aggregates where things are arranged in a manner that there is perfect uptake by the plant by signaling that the plant gives to the aggregate to release the nutrients. Mm -hmm. That release is what you're looking for. And these are called signaling molecules. This is one of the things that the roots do is they exude carbon in a fluid into the rhizosphere where the aggregate is, is located. So they pulse, they pulse, right? When you say exude, they're pulsing this material into the soil? Uh, yes, depending on conditions above ground, the plant will contribute this carbon and protein and signal loaded material into the rhizosphere that we call exudate to signal the microbes and the chemistry of what to do. The plant is signaling and giving the directions to the inanimate objects and to the bacteria and fungi, nematode and protozoa of what to do, what, what the plant needs. That's great, Bobby. And Bob, you know, you, you said something earlier about, you know, the humic structures holding on to water, being able to hold the water. I know I have a personal experience with our, you know, our compost piles from our farms are 27 years old and we've been recycling them and reusing them on our farm. And when I get heavy rains, I noticed because of the humic, uh, 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 composition of that pile um, that it never gets sloppy. It just holds so much water 
and then it never really gets muddy or sloppy. It just like releases any additional water and it drains off. And it's amazing to me. I, I, that phenomena has been really a, a wonderful thing to see uh, happen after rainstorms. And within one day, I could go in there and screen it and it's just the perfect moisture level, you know? Your observation there, I use to teach young, uh, I use to teach folks that are just learning about compost. I let a little rain happen or we go out and water the compost pile and then go in and start to observe how far it went. And you start to find that, holy smoke, a, a couple of inches of compost holds all that water that I put on. A lot of times the report will be to me is that, well, I can't get water to go in it. This is the absorption capacity of humus. In fact, we can judge the humus levels in the compost pile with experience by how that water is acting. It acts very different when it's held by humus than when it's held by non-humified materials. Right on. There's a question here, Bobby. Um, you mentioned the plant cover crops, then observe how they grow and plant more and different cover crops in response. What methods can we use to decide our response? This is an awesome chat session. Thank you so much. Um, I, I honestly am not sure if I understand the question, but I'm going to answer it. What methods can we use to decide our response? Methods as far as the response, as far as uh, uh, observe how they grow and plant more different cover okay. crops. So look, there's a lot of information online, uh, even from the, and from the University of Hawaii, of how you can go out to an existing uh, cover crop stand, uh, take a square foot or a square yard, cut it down, weigh it, and make estimates of the amount of nitrogen that's in the green tissue. When we try to look at the root system, which is a very large contributor to uh, nitrogen being contributed back to the soil from the cover crop once it's cut, it's a little harder to pull up that, those roots and weigh them and make the estimate. So by, this, by destructive practice is one way that you can go in and see what you've got. Um, we can look at a cover crop just in a casual way. And a lot of times I've asked farmers, I said, do you have a cover crop? And they go, yeah, I've got a cover crop. And when I look at it, it's only three inches tall. So yeah, you got a cover crop, but I need a cover crop that has some size to it, that has some bulk to it. And so I can judge it just by my senses if it's big enough to actually contribute organic matter. Remember, even though we love the fact that a lot of carbon is being put into the soil by the cover crop, a lot of carbon is being put into the soil by the compost being used by the, with the cover crop, we're still losing 66% of the carbon contained in the plant while the plants on the surface. And so it's the contribution of carbon from the roots that really counts in this equation. Another way I can measure the benefit of my cover crop is, is to watch it. Watch the number of beneficial insects in your cover crop. Watch right. the way the cover crop protects the surface, both from sunlight and from, if I cut it a little bit, I can lay it down and watch what happens to the soil surface with a cover crop. It's very convincing. It's what convinced me to continue cover cropping back in 1980. I had cover cropped all through the 80, all through the 80s. But by 1990, I was working on commercial farms and it was the observations in the 80s that convinced me that I could install cover crops on large acreages and I was gonna get the same benefit, which we did and continue to do today. You know, back in 2017, we had um, at our convention in Y and I at Kahumana, uh, where our chapter is, we put in a polyculture of cover crops through Oahu RC and D and, uh, and then had Gabe Brown come out and, um, and also Jen Kuchira, um, who was working uh, with the uh, NRCS. And um, after that, after the uh, convention, um, uh, you know, Christian Zuckerman, um, the farmer there said that he had the best carrot crop ever in that soil. He planted carrots and he said the harvest was just amazing. And, you know, so it really speaks to how they, that opens up the soil. Yeah, Bob? Cover crops are very good at breaking hard pans, uh, providing enough organic matter to cause some uh, beneficial tilth uh, improvements on soil. Let's play, let's play devil's advocate. I used to be a big fan of green manuring. 
I spent a lot of my young life green manuring. When I started working in perennials, I had the opportunity to cover crop on one side of vines or trees and then cover crop on the other side of vines and trees. So we started splitting up our cultural practice, our management practice, and we would green manure one side and the other side would leave in just mown residue. And that teaches you very quickly that just because you grow a cover crop doesn't mean you're gonna get improvements. It's how we manage the cover crop. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's if we include the cover crop in a system that includes nutrient management, compost, and tillage management. This is where we'll see the really big improvements such as uh, uh, Christian is referring to there. Uh, carrots are a very demanding crop. I've been around commercial carrot growing and to do it well, uh, even small scale carrot growing, to do it well, uh, a couple of rotations, a few cover crops. Remember that when we add compost to cover crops, the Russell Ranch in California uh, at UC Davis, it's a USDA, University of California long-term research at the Russell Ranch in Winters, California. It's been there uh, 27 years now. I visited uh, the Russell Ranch two years ago. We had several hours with them. I had 12 of the largest farmers in Australia with me. We were there to see their long-term trials. We wanted to know what was going on with the uh, use of cover crops and compost. I was sort of being challenged by the Australians on this. They wanted to see someplace that had long-term research. And in, their, in the Russell Ranch's 2019 publication that's available online right now, they found that by adding compost to the cover crop, the carbon was going deep in the soil. So what this is, when we put, com when compost is well-made and has a lot of humus in it, there is a water soluble fraction that can release of that carbon in the humus and in some of the non-humified carbon in the compost. That water soluble material can go deeper than the cover crop roots can go in a short period of time. The cover crop is adding to the carbon, it's causing channeling, it's feeding the microbes, the compost is adding extra humic acid, it's adding humus. Look, I love compost, but it doesn't have roots. I love roots, but it doesn't have humic. And so the two together have been shown now both in 2019 and then in 2005 when uh, Paul Hepperly, uh, Rita Seidel and Don Lauder published their paper showing the results from the, I don't know, it's 30 some years at Rodale. They found the same thing. In 12 long-term research projects around the world right now, they're all showing the same thing. When we use some type of manure or compost along with cover crops and a rational lack of tillage, we get improvements in soil. We get to soil diversity, which leads us to soil health. Every time, this is a long-term research uh, finding now. Well, let's let's talk more about some compost here. I know, um, you know, folks are always looking for good quality compost and it's basically not available here in Hawaii. And, you know, with uh, I, I like to, you know, reference Hawaii as we're a biomass machine with all this biomass above the ground and we don't do a very good job managing it. I mean, I, I know personally when I cut back stuff, when I cut back trees and then feed it, they come back with a vengeance. So, you know, all that material that I cut back, composting it just seems like a no brainer. Yet we're taking amazing amount of material to the dump. Uh, it goes, thankfully it's, it, there is green waste separation and they are making it into chips, but there just seems to be this disconnect as to the waste management. Could you speak to that and speak to the work you did in San Francisco regarding that? Well, we do need to be, do a better job of composting here. We do need compost here in Hawaii. Um, with the amount of biomass that we produce and with our ability to grow C4 legumes, C4 grasses, big forbs, we have enough mulch material. We can get, we can get grown, we can get mulch, we can do roll downs and plant back into it. A little bit of compost goes a long ways in that system. We don't have to build uh, maybe as much as, as I'd like to have on some farms because we do convert a lot of material over to humus just through our natural environment. Um, the, the Green Waste Program started in California because of California's mandate to not throw it into the landfill. So we had a law. 
And once the law started, then we had a whole bunch of organic matter to compost. It's as simple as that. Um, I work with recology. I still work with recology. And we showed ourselves that we could build really good, clean material from recycled green waste. We have green waste here in Hawaii. We can get it clean. We can you know, work with the public. It's an ongoing job in California to work with the public, especially in a large city. But Recology does it, other people can do it. And we put out a, a very good quality product for not very much money. You realize that in Northern California right now, all the compost operations are sold out. If you don't buy compost by this time of year, you're not gonna get it because there's been so much adoption by farmers. And just to remind you, uh, I shouldn't say it that way, farmers are very smart people. They watch what happens over a period of time. And they didn't adopt compost because it didn't work. They right. adopted compost because it did work. And you can't hardly buy it now. And compost is at about less than 15 bucks per cubic yard. Mm. Australia is about 125 bucks per cubic yard. They have a problem right now because there's not enough people. Okay. There just aren't that many people. The distances are big. They're having to haul stuff. Buck 25 a cubic yard a real problem. So my advice to the growers in Australia, start building your own on site. And that's my advice to people here in Hawaii. Let's build small quantities of really good quality vermipost or thermal or static compost and use it on our farms. So that's the limiting factor. Yeah, the, the, the shipping, the, the moving it around. In other words, to, to make your compost, like you were saying, in, in the vicinity of where you're going to use it, not have to be trucking it all over the place. Huh? If you do a world literature, literature search right now on what's the business case for making compost, for starting a compost operation, one of the agreed upon and I agree upon uh, factors is you can't truck things very far at all. Little teeny distance is all you get before it just blows apart the economics. Okay, we have to scale the compost operations to the size of the organic matter present that can be economically handled. We have to do this economically and end up with low cost material. I'll be the first one to say that though, if you take compost and you look at what's in it, okay, so you take the nitrogen, the phosphorus and the potassium, the calcium, the magnesium, sulfur and the, and the micronutrients, and then attach a price to them. You can look, if you need those nutrients, if you're buying NP or K or sulfur, magnesium or calcium, which most of us are buying, or want to buy, but they're expensive. So if you look at what the cost of that material is, and you're gonna buy it anyway, then you look at what's in your compost, then you give those pennies back to that process, and you find out that the compost doesn't cost that much as long as we haven't spent too much making it, because we get that dollars back. Also, remember that compost, each year we apply it, a lot of times there's a lot of fear because we're only gonna get 15% or so, maybe 25% of the nitrogen that's in the compost. But the second year, there's another 25% comes out. In the third year, the third 25% comes out or the whole thing. And we're applying three years in a row. So you folks that do math well can understand this better than me. After about three years, we have a quantum effect. And the problem becomes making sure you don't apply too much compost rather than a problem with the economics of compost. Compost becomes so effective over a five year period that you need to moderate what you put in and start emphasizing the compost, or excuse me, the cover crop and the mulch more, making sure that the nutrients are straight. Without calcium oh. and phosphate in the soil, we're not going to get the job done of having the compost work right. Well, and you know, these are all wonderful points, Bobby. I, you know, we're, this time has just flown by we're at a point where we have to wrap this up. I wanted to share though with everybody out there, um, one of the things I found with compost that just blew me away. I read an article about soil humus, that it's good for mental health. And in doing a fast and eliminating, I noticed I was getting a headache. So for anybody out there who, got a head who gets the headaches, I would suggest if you're making compost and it's cured compost, you take that compost, and I did this already, so it works. And 
you bring your nose up to it and just start inhale and exhale, inhale and exhale very slowly and the headache went away. So, you know, the microbiology in compost, the beneficial microbiology in compost is just amazing. These are brave new world. Paul Stamets and the work that he does, you know, Bobby is in the work that Paul does and, and has shared with us at our convention is part of our presentations we have uh, on the website from our convention. The mycelial network that goes on under the ground and all these things that we don't get to see and you're working on and it's your passion and Paul's passion. And I'm just so excited about the level of expertise that's out there. I truly appreciate you, Bobby, and, and bringing your expertise here tonight. Uh, is there any closing remarks you wanna to give to everybody out there? Oh, this is a great time to uh, build compost and take care of our farms. You know, we have to raise more food in Hawaii and today is our time, and this is, a, this is what we need to do. Uh, I would advocate uh, to please see compost uh, as part of a system, see com cover crops as part of a system, and use systems to make our farms healthy and di diversified and healthy. Well, beautiful. And, and what I'll do is I just put up on the screen here, Bobby, uh, to let everybody know this is an initiative that we're putting forth. Um, working with uh, Travis Thomason of NRCS, and um, as you can see, the key partners, the people that we're bringing to the table, this is going to happen March 30th, our first initial meeting. And Bobby, as I've spoken to you before, you're going to be one of our expert resource people that we're going to tap into along the way. But this first meeting is going to, going to get the buy-in to people to see their vision and their values of what represents you know, their understanding of soil health and how we can bring this more forward here in Hawaii and take the, the, the foot off the gas pedal around all the energy and, and the resources that are put to pesticides and herbicides and all this petrochemical modalities that just don't work on the long run. And so we wanna build our resilience systems here in Hawaii. We wanna, we wanna be able to support our family farmers and we feel the best way to go about doing that is start in the soil and start to get our soils healthy. So with that said, I wanna thank you Bobby so much for being here and sharing your mana'o and your not only your mana'o, but your, your life uh, work and experience. You've been a, a really good friend and, and to, to me and, and also to agriculture here in Hawaii. So really appreciate you, brother. Thank you so much for being on tonight. Aloha, Vince. Aloha. And now we got Bobby Madero. This is the Bobby and Bobby Show, the continuance of the Bobby and Bobby Show. Uh, Bobby's gonna take us out with some slack key music, Hawaiian music. and. As you can see on the screen here, if you want to be, if you're not a member of the Farmers Union, you don't have to be a farmer, you can be a farmer, gardener, or you just eat. You eat, you can be a farmer, you can be a Farmers Union member. That gives us numbers, folks. That gives us numbers that when we go to the legislature and we share what we feel is in the best interest of agriculture and support of our farmers here in Hawaii, that gives us the, the clout to be able to have those, that Manao heard by legislature. So please support uh, Farmers Union by becoming a member. There's great discounts. Katie can let you know all about it when you're in touch with her on it, and, and she'd be happy to help you sign up if you need help. So uh, uh, go to our site here, hfuu.org. And again, Bobby, thank you very much. And Bobby Madero, please take us out, brother. Thanks for being here, brother. It's, a, it's, a, it's an honor being a part of you all. Um, that was so informative, man. That's what we need more of. Um, Thank you. Definitely. Uh, it's been an honor to be a part of you all here. Well, you're in our family now, Bobby. Thank you so very much. I'm going to do a, this is quite a long song. So I'll do one more for you guys and saying aloha to each and every one of you. Blessings to each and every one of you. It's a song that was written by my uncle Jerry Santos. And he wrote this song for his sister. And he called her home from San Francisco with this song and it's uh, become quite gospel, I could say for a lot of us here in Hawaii. Ine. And uh, I recorded this on my solo record to pay homage to uh, Uncle Jerry. So teach and every one of you, Vincent, the gang, thank you guys so very much for allowing me to be a part of you guys. Blessings to you all, keep Hawaii green. We'll see you all again soon. So hey, Bobby, Bobby, just so you know, Jerry Santos played at our wedding. So I was really fortunate to have that experience. So thank you for ending with this. This is awesome. Love it.
for you, my brother. Wow, congratulations, man. That's what it's all about. I must have been quite a reception, I tell oh, you. Wonderful, yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you guys again soon. For you, my brother. Aloha. Aloha.
I remember days when we were smiling. We laughed and sang the whole night long. And I will read you as I find you. With the sharing of a brand new song. Last night I dreamt I was returning. And my heart called out to you. Please accept me as you find me. Hey, aloha, 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 Blessings to each and every one of you. Thank you so very much. I'm Bobby Madero. Aloha, guys. Beautiful, beautiful, brother. Thank you so much, man. That was awesome. Make aloha, come on, kahalu, baby. So the guys, yeah, baby. So everybody, just so you know, two weeks from tonight, April seventh, we got Bobby Grimes going to follow tonight with compost tea. And he is the guru of compost teas. So there's a great segue from tonight's conversation into a conversation with Bobby Grimes. So please be here on the seventh. We're not sure yet of the musical guest, but we'll get we'll get that squared away and get it to you. Thank you, Vincent Kimura. Thank you, HFUU, and all the people that are here tonight. Thank you for being here and appreciate you supporting HFUU's efforts. Bobby and Bobby, you guys are the best. Appreciate you both. Thank you so much. This is the kind of spirit that HFUU is built on. So we love and appreciate you all. Have a good night, everybody. Stay positive and test negative, okay? Aloha.